the complexity of our study needs to lead to simplicity in our coaching and our and the outcomes that we're looking for. I don't think more knowledge is ever an issue. Mm -hmm. I think we can get really good at analyzing movement, trying to see exactly what's going on, different phases of gait, understanding what positions people need access to, what positions they're avoiding, and still understand the constraints and how we actually learn and use our biomechanical knowledge to deliver very simple methods of changing how they move without trying to force people into a box. Hey guys, before we get to this week's episode, I wanted to let you know about an exciting development at Evolve Move Play. So we are bringing back our two-day traveling workshops. So, so that means one of our workshops might be coming out to a city new, near you, or potentially you could reach out to us and bring us to a city near you. We did this for years. I started, when I started Evolve Move Play, I taught traveling workshops all over the world from 2013 to 2019. But after the birth of my youngest daughter, I needed to stay home more with my wife and my three kids. And so we stopped those. But now we have a really amazing staff of teachers who've come up with me through the retreats of the last few years. And I myself have a little bit more freedom to travel. So we've got four upcoming dates here in the States and two dates in Europe coming up where you can come and train with us for just two days. That means it's going to be a lot easier entry point as far as cost and logistics for you to come and join us. So check out what's going on with our two-day workshops in the link down below. And we look forward to seeing you in a city near you soon. David, uh, welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast. Thanks, Rafe. I'm looking forward to the chat. I've followed your work from quite a distance, I will say, but I've been aware of you for quite a, quite a while uh, through actually some guys that I was kind of friendly with in Australia and Sydney. I lived there for a few years. So Craig Mallet, Dave, oh. Dave Wardman, I hung around with some of those guys. So that's where I became aware of you. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the chat. Nice. I had no idea you're connected to, to Craig and Dave. I um, So for those who are not familiar with David, David is a physical therapist in uh, Waterford, Ireland. And he is teaching seminars all over on, you know, how to how to move better and how to take care of your joints and how to understand uh, some of the biomechanics that we face. And I think you're a representative of, you know, what I think of as a newer school of, of physical therapy thinking, um, which is a bit more sophisticated in understanding the joint dynamics and how they uh, apply to, um, to what's happening in the core. And so, yeah, I've been watching your stuff for a while. I, I don't know that I understand it fully. I'm, I'm working my way through it. And I'm excited to, to get to know you. I think that this kind of information is really, really valuable for the parkour community and for the movement community in general to be able to get into some of this thinking around gait and around uh, the different joint complexes that we use and, and how we can how we can work better with them. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to I'm trying to learn more from the parkour community as well. Uh, <laughs> I, I definitely missed that whole wave maybe it just was an Irish thing it wasn't big or anything like that but uh only when I hit my probably mid-20s I was like oh these people move really well <laughs> and like how did I how did I miss this stuff and um yeah I I probably have a slightly different view I'm actually I'm kind of like half a physical therapist so we, I took like I went like a sneaky route around it did like half a course uh mm. that allowed me just to be able to put hands on people and to work and rehab people and work with people in pain, but I couldn't work in like a medical setting, let's say. So, um, so yeah, I'll just correct, correct you on that, but oh, it's, there's, no, it's, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's just, it's, it's both good and bad. Um, good in that I didn't have the traditional education, maybe that I went like learning from all these cool people around the world first and, and didn't learn my like anatomy and biomechanics and, and just looking at movement. I didn't learn that through a book first. I had to go back and learn it later, but that wasn't my first. I learned it by moving and talking to smart people. So that's why I probably have a slightly different way of looking at things, I think, than most therapists, let's say. Well, yeah, let's start there. So um, I'm, I'm super intrigued because, you know, Dave and, uh, and Craig are quite interesting people. Um, and and Dave, of course, has, well, both of them have pretty advanced uh, practices of of looking at the body in really interesting ways. So you, if I remember correctly, your background athletically was in rugby? Uh, Gaelic football and yeah. hurling, a couple of, couple of Irish sports, yeah. So similar to rugby, similar to like Australian rules. Yeah. Uh, just just better, to be honest. Just better. <laughs> I've, uh, <laughs> when I was... Um, <clears throat> 
15 years old, I, I, I had saved up a bunch of money selling apple cider and I got to, uh, to, uh, I, uh, I bought tickets to Ireland and went to Ireland, uh, and Scotland when I was 15 and I got to watch, I think the all Ireland, uh, Gaelic footballs, uh, Gaelic football championships, um, sitting in a, in a little pub on an Island off the West coast of Mayo. Mm-hmm. Nice. And uh, I've always thought it was just the coolest game. So just, um, this is totally a tangent, but what in the world is going on with Gaelic football? Like, how does it differ from rugby, American football, soccer, these sports that most people might be more familiar with? Uh, Gaelic football is is easier to understand for people than hurling. Hurling is completely foreign because you have a stick and a ball, but you have 15 men on a very big field, a large field. So, like, the ball travels very, very fast. So, think, mm-hmm. like, hockey or a mix between hockey and lacrosse but on a huge, big field, like bigger than a, a rugby field. And it's very, very physical. Gaelic football is is easier to understand. It's kind of basically like soccer. You could have, you, we would call it soccer here because we have Gaelic football. I, I know in America, you probably call it soccer as well. Yeah. So um, there's a ball, you're going to kick a ball, but we can also catch the ball. So yeah, like a hybrid of different things. And um, they're great sports. They're really like very physical tactical technical skill-based sports there's a huge demand on just kind of being pretty good at everything uh in terms of like you're solving movement problems working with your team there's different types of positions but each position like you have to be pretty good all-round mover to play but then there's obviously different slightly more specialist positions so so um so yeah it's good it's it's a lot, so of, a lot of issues with the injuries. The ball. I would say. Can you yeah, carry the you ball can. as long as you want? Or do you... No. Okay. You can take four steps with the ball in your hands and then you have to do one of two things. You can either bounce the ball, which you bounce it on the ground and catch it again. Yeah. Uh, that's one option. But if you take a bounce, you can't take another bounce. You have to then solo the ball, which is drop the foot, drop the ball onto your, onto your foot and kind of almost like kick it back into your hands, but mm-hmm. not really a kick. It's almost like a small little scoop as you run full speed. So you can keep the ball in your hand as long as you want, as long as you solo or hop the ball. Um, yeah, but the longer you hold on, the more chance you have of getting nailed out, nailed by someone. So that's also an issue. So we're not allowed to tackle like you would in rugby, where we, we have to hit someone with our shoulder or like with your chest. You can't actually grab them, let's say. Mm, interesting. So you can... So it's it's almost it reminds me of basketball a little bit, right? Because you have this aspect where you're you're the ball has to interact with the ground so often in order yeah. to keep you moving. And there's contact, but not full tackling. Exactly. Yep. And then there's goals and points. So there's a, a normal like soccer type of goal with a goalkeeper. Yeah. And if you put the ball in the goal, you get three points. But also the goal extends where there's two posts that go up in the up in the sky like rugby posts. And if you put the ball between the posts but over the crossbar, you get one point. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. It sounds like it's very complex, but really it's just yeah. It sounds, I mean, are, yeah. <laughs> I think it makes. I think it actually is. It's very logical when you lay it out. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like soccer except for you can carry the ball but you have to you can only carry the ball for a certain number of steps before you have to either bounce it off the ground and get one chance to do that or you can kick it to yourself but exactly can kind of push you around bump into you they just can't grab you and take you to the ground got it and uh and then i imagine when someone's bumping into you they can grab the ball take it from you take it the other way exactly so you gotta move the ball around from between players in order to uh, to create scoring opportunities and then there's two ways to score yeah um how does that do how is i'm just i don't know you may know how does that compare to aussie rules very similar and actually every it's either every year or every two years they actually play uh something called compromise rules against the best players in ireland play against the best players in australia but but in Australia, they don't have a goal. They don't have a goalkeeper. They have goal posts, but they don't have a goal itself. So in this compromise rules game, it's either played in Australia or Ireland every second year or whatever. And they do end up with a goalkeeper. And Aust- Australian rules play with like a rugby-shaped ball. But for this game, they play with a round ball. 
but then in Australian rules, you can actually rugby tackle people. So in this game, compromise rules game, they actually play where you can rugby tackle people. The issue with this compromise rules game was because there wasn't that much at stake, they ended up for many, many years, absolutely beating the shit out of each other. Like it was just brawls <laughs> on the pitch because if I get sent off in that game, it's at the end of the season. I, there's not, I don't really care if I get suspended. I'm not going to get yeah. suspended or anything. So it ended very poorly. And Australian, well, sorry, it, it, it's still going, but they're trying to clean it up a little bit. But Australian rules was Ireland were later getting into like the kind of professional sports type of training, the gym work and all that stuff. So about probably 15 years ago, there was one series in particular where the Irish players weren't as big and strong as they would be now, but the Australian players were humongous <laughs> and they absolutely bet the shit out of the Irish players. So I think that like tra almost transformed Gaelic football and hurling where the Irish players realized we're going to, we're going to hit the gym maybe even 20 years ago now. But as a result, I think we started to see the Irish games change quite significantly the players got very big very bulky turned into bodybuilders and i think we started to see early retire a lot of our we definitely started to see a lot of early retirements i think we started to see injuries crop up that probably weren't cropping up as much before like hip injuries and groins and people that just got very very rigid and and were trying to cut, carry a lot more mass around the field and obviously there's an opportunity cost to everything you do. You get you get bigger, you get stronger. If you do it in a silly way, you're going to limit your movement. And that's definitely what happened. And we're we're only really now in our Irish sports coming back from that. And people are starting to value skill again and being able to cover ground and being able to change direction and being quick and elusive rather than just trying to bash into people. Yeah, that's fascinating. I the you know in, in american football we have probably the i would say i mean maybe rugby is at the same level but american football players may be the most impressive athletes in the world right like yeah if you're looking at vertical leap speed change of direction combined with just sheer mass right like you see a like dk metcalf uh, plays here for the seattle seahawks he's a Six foot three, 230 pounds. Uh, he went out and ran a 1036 100 meter, you know, for fun in the off season. Mm -hmm. Freak. Um, I think, you know, I think his broad jumps like, you know, 11 plus feet, you know, 37 inch vertical, something like that. And at the same time that our physical preparation system is working to create these absolute physical monsters really failing to keep them from getting injured so i i have a one of my one of my students was a, a physical therapist for the seattle seahawks and i sat down with him and the sports scientist guy from seattle seahawks and i had heard that the acl tear rate had tripled over the last 20 years in the nfl and i asked them about that and i said well it's really hard to say because the teams are really guarded with their injury reports. And so they're not going to like give them to a scientist, but it sounds about right. That was kind of their take on it. Well, I've also seen the Achilles tendon tear rate go through the root roof as well. It looks like to me. And so my theory about this is actually that it's a lack of movement diversity, but I wonder how much of it is also just like the sheer physical power and size that we are getting. Is that, is it, possible for us to to carry that healthily um mm -hmm. without some sort of compromise so if you look at like what happened with irish football is it they got just that they got big and strong and then therefore the injury rate went up or they got big and strong in a way that that wasn't well calibrated to actually preparing them for the demands of their sport aside from carrying that mass and being more explosive i don't i, I certainly don't think it's it's a strength I wouldn't I wouldn't say think it's a strength thing necessarily in terms of I can only see more strength as a good thing. It's just when more strength is paired with yeah, silly training that ends up with you moving like a robot. And that is unfortunately very, very common. With the 
Achilles tendon ruptures, I would tend, especially the ruptures, I, I do see a lot more tendinopathies now. And I see a lot of like adductor stuff and anterior hip and anterior pelvis. I, I, w- I, w- I, would, I would put that slightly aside from the ruptures, to be honest, particularly Achilles ruptures, because I think that you could probably map a large portion of that to a huge spike in load for people <laughs> where where there's just uh, i think a lot of these things are happening in the in the preseason a lot of the time as well a lot of injuries are happening in the preseason not as much in the in season or maybe like at the very towards the end of the season where if I, I think if you mapped out like Achilles ruptures with the amount of games that 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 these players are now playing, the amount of minutes that they're on the field, the amount of ground that they're covering, the amount of speed that they're actually covering the ground in, I think you would see. I don't know. I have no idea, but I think you would see a strong correlation between like these are they're putting way more force through their body and they're having to do it way more often, and this is why professional like if you take professional soccer players in the premier league in england people are i've 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 been lucky enough to work with different people from different sports and people laugh like the armchair supporter laughs all the time like oh they have such an easy life they just go training for an hour a day and lie on the couch and actually they're playing like premier league players if they're playing in the champions league they might be playing international football they're playing two 90 minute games almost every week of the year Mm-hmm. and they're getting three four five six weeks off season it's a very long season they're flying they're they're on buses all the time they're like they they don't have the energy to do anything else except for lie on their couch in between yeah. so there's a massive demand and that's just the professionalism and the demand of being on television and having all these events happening and basically money is just milking I think sports are just milking athletes for everything they've got. And it's not a surprise to see injuries go up. And of course, poor training is part of it. Poor movement is part of it, but it's definitely not the only thing. Yeah. I was talking to that, that same friend, Michael Tankovich about um, the fact that NFL athletes are, are actually very sedentary in a weird way. Yeah. Like there's very (laughs) little, um, there's very little movement in between in moderate intensities. So they, they all, you know, they have three, four practices a week that are very intense. Um, you know, putting a ton of miles at high intensity on the athlete. Then they have their strength training practices, right. And, and then they have all the meetings, right. Tons of, of strategy meetings where they're sitting in chairs for long periods of time. Then there's the bus rides. Then there's the plane rides. And you can imagine, and you know, they're often at the facility at 5 a.m., leave the facility at 9. Um, it's not like they're gardening or going for a walk or playing with their no. kids or hanging out with their dog. Like there's no time for anything that's not. And I imagine that with the body beat up and tired, it's like you don't you don't want to do anything physical in between your um your practices so uh it's a it's a very strange a very interesting aspect of like combining underloading with overloading yeah yeah and it's all like their their training is very compressive activities overcoming stiffening up i have a heavy heavy barrel and they, they need a suit of armor on their bodies they need a lot of muscle uh th- there's someone else that's going to be there trying to literally yeah drive them through the ground basically so they need a lot of protection there but in the gym then they're squeezing they're compressing they're creating as much tension as they can on the field there's a lot of that as well depending on the position you play maybe less maybe more but there's a lot of like overcoming a lot of squeezing and there's not much there's not much variability in their movement there's not much think of even just sitting on a plane in a sitting in a in a meeting room in a gym where we're lifting heavy heavy loads it's a lot of like tension let's say Mm -hmm. and there's not much that lets go of tension even there and even if you think about their recovery sessions they have they might have uh, okay the day after a game we meet as a team and go and do a recovery session and if you look at the faces because i've been i've been in some of these environments they're they're doing they're doing kind of yoga stretching where they're holding a hamstring stretch in an isometric and they're grimacing and bracing against that and there's just it's it's just 
trying to fight more tension with tension. There's very little walking, like breathing work, fluid movement. There's no yielding work in the gym. It's all about how much tension we can create. And that that is going to catch up with you. Yeah. I wonder, like, I think we 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 have these actuarial tables around athletic ability, right? Where we kind of expect, okay, well, if the best athletes in the world are sort of past their peak at 32, 33, that's that's just when that's supposed to happen in life. But I wonder how much of that is like, it's like a field that's been harvested too many times and you've exhausted and depleted the soil. And if you just, just gave that soil a little bit more love, a little bit more rest in between, it might produce for you a lot longer. Mm -hmm. You look at some of the best athletes that have had longevity, people like Roger Federer, yeah. Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, they have continue to operate at the very highest level for a long long time and we could call them freaks they probably are freaks but i think sometimes we should study the freaks as well and they do they don't they don't look like people that are only geared towards just carrying and creating more and more tension and compression all the time Mm -hmm. They look, when you look at Roger Federer moving, he doesn't look like the fastest tennis player. He doesn't necessarily look like the strongest. He doesn't necessarily look like the fittest, but he does move incredibly fluid and he looks incredibly efficient with his movement. And I think over a 15 year career, a 10 year career, the amount of miles you're putting on your body, that efficiency has to start to pay dividends. It, and it, it, it obviously does. It does. We don't, I don't think we necessarily need a study because that that's an impossible study to conduct because what do you measure? But I think even my granny would be able to say that tennis player looks, that looks nice. That looks tidy. That looks pretty. That looks efficient versus this guy is just always, oh, everything is about creating as much tension as possible, which is a good strategy as well. There might just might not be as much longevity in it. Yeah. So let's talk. I'm, I'm very curious about you. You mentioned the idea that their activities are compressive. And so I think this is, uh, a language that's coming out of specific kind of rehab traditions and, and and physical therapy traditions that a lot of people aren't going to be familiar with. So can we talk about compressive versus expansive strategies in movement and, you know, what the difference is, how it arises, you know, stuff like that. Uh, yes. And I, I, maybe I'm not the best person. I, I'll just, because there, there is like an, a compression expansion model. Bill Hartman has actually kind of come out with that model. And I don't use a lot of the language, but you will hear me kind of sprinkle in compression expansion sometimes. So I'll, I, I won't speak for the model. I'll just kind of speak for my idea around it. Um, so I think, I think an, 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 easy, an easy way to look at compression versus expansion you could actually break it down into the gait cycle if you wanted. So you could start to think of stance phase versus swing phase. And you don't even have to drill too much into stance. Like you could break stance into earlier stance, mid stance, late stance, etc. And you could break swing into different phases. But if you think about if you think about stance versus swing, then there's a lot more compression going to be on the stance side. There's a lot more kind of squeezing and tension being created and swing is our chance to get a lot more expansion, even if, and I, I have kind of a slide in our, in my workshop that I, cause I try and make this super, super simple, but I have a slide in my, one of my workshops that just kind of breaks down. Even if you look at the rib cage, cause when you start to look at a rib cage, it, it makes it easier to see kind of compression and expansion, but it really it's happening everywhere. So when we're stacked over our stance leg, let's say I have my right leg in front and I'm going to stand on that right leg especially in mid stance, you'll start to see this lateral flexion of the spine towards the right. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of side bent. So if you broke the rib cage into two halves, la laterally, at least, so the right side of the rib cage and the left side of the rib cage in stance, if I'm on my right leg, the right side of my rib cage will be closed and kind of squeezed and compressed. And the left side of my la rib cage will be open and expanded and more, yeah, more maybe stretched. So that's happening through the rib cage, but you could also look at that through the foot where actually because my body weight is on top of my foot, my foot is actually compressing down. My body is compressing down into my foot and my foot is compressing down into the floor. So compression really is just kind of how we push. 
It's how we push the ground away. And we will be more most compressed in stance phase. If you even look at someone, let's say someone who's doing a drop jump or something like that, they're jumping off a box or uh mm-hmm. uh yeah, I will you I will use a drop jump rather than maybe a parkour type of position because that you can go another layer deep there. But if we just say I'm gonna drop off a box and then hit the floor and come back up again, if you even look at someone's hands, look at their face, look at their neck in the air, they're they're it, on the ground at least when they hit the ground and oh, that's short phase when they're on the ground even if they want to get off the ground fast they're they're all kind of squeezed their elbows will be in tight their hands will be squeezed their neck will be squeezed it look like they have tension through their face and then as they start to come and they're leaving the ground again you start to see everything open back up so mm-hmm. that's an example of like full body compression and expansion on a on a bilateral but then when you split it into stance and swing you start to see very compressed in stance, not so much in swing, and then it switches. So I go right, left, I'm compressing on my right, I'm compressing on my left. And again, maybe a nice way for people to start to think about it is when you start to see people who who do a lot of activities on a double leg all of the time, a perfect example is probably powerlifters. They end up very tight, very squeezed in general. You look at them walking And they kind of walk like they're still doing a one or M squat, their body, their spine stays in those shapes. And it's because they've actually learned to compress and squeeze so much that now they can't expand and open up on one side, which allows them to compress on the other side and kind of shift this nice frontal plane movement and internal and external rotation to help them shift from side to side. So they just end up squeezed everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's, a great strategy for them to lift heavy loads in that way. The more tension I can create, the better, but maybe not so great if you want to be varied in your movement and, and do different activities. So I hope that kind of yeah. helps in some way. So what I'm in my mind, what I'm imagining is like a, the body has a fascial network and like a tensegrity. And when you hit the ground, that whole thing kind of gets squeezed. Yeah. Right. And so face squeezes, the hand squeeze, everything sort of, comes in to distribute that shock through the system and then as we come off the ground and now it's not it's not tensioned so we can open up um and yeah the the idea that when we are doing a bilateral barbell squat the whole system is obviously going to be pulled tight and it has to be pulled tight um you know that's the only way to to manage the that particular form of stress but it's not it's not exactly like a lot of our athletic movements where we're we're cycling between these these two things can you talk about the role of uh of the fluid dynamics in the torso as well so we have kind of that idea of the fascial network and how it's getting compressed but what's happening to that hydraulic chamber of the center of the body as we you know how does that impact this compression expansion dynamic and the strategies to different athletes apply so I'm definitely not the best person to ask about okay. this. <laughs> I'll, I'll get Bill hopefully on the on the channel. Yeah, Bill or Greg Hawthorne came on to yeah. my podcast and spoke and spoke quite a bit about that. Um, I will give a very very brief answer in, in terms of the the sloshing around of the guts and all of the fluid inside our bodies, and it's typically not been spoken about. I would say um are we we have traditionally looked at things in terms of like strength and flexibility that's it like how strong and how mobile are you strong and tight are you strong and weak and obviously movement there's so much more going on than that there's a lot of preflexes and reflexes and coordination and just a million bazillion things that we could never necessarily even understand but fluid dynamics has to be one of those and we have a lot of stuff inside our body and how that actually sloshes around is going to is going to help us move or if it's not slashing around very much it's going to help us not move so i think that the way that i think about it is is very simply let's say i'm going into a let's say i'm going to throw a medicine ball i'm going to load into my right hip and then throw the medicine ball out to you as i load back all that fluid in my guts is going to have to move in the same direction as the ball and then as i try and throw the ball away the fluid in the guts is going to have to go in the same direction as the ball again but there may be uh not necessarily at the exact same time and you can kind of see that if you start to see a pitcher throwing or something like that you might start to see 
a, a, a like a delay of the of the of the pelvis and the and the thorax as they kind of separate from each other a little bit and that's i think helping us generate a bit of motion and you might see the same um with regards to if you think about it the same way with regards to the diaphragm and the pelvic floor you might start to think of things as like uh, someone jumping on a trampoline where i'm jumping and everything is going down the diaphragm is pushing down the guts are pushing down the pelvic floor is pushing down and then it's all going to have to push back up again as i come back up so that that would be that would be our jumping that has to happen it can't it has to be a timing of this where i i would really not like to be hitting the floor and my pelvic floor is pushing up when everything is loading back down that's not really going to help me load that way so i don't think we have evidence or anything for this but it kind of starts to make sense that all these things are generating and helping us move in certain directions and this the the, the practical aspect because that that might be super theoretical but the practical aspect of that for me at least is we need to make sure our spines and pelvises and rib cages are mobile because a lot of people let's say they have back pain or back issues and we start to teach them or traditionally at least we start to teach them to fight a lot of tension with tension okay you have a tight back i'm going to tighten your core up you, mm -hmm. you you know you're going to start to do a lot of planks and side planks and squeezing and all of this stuff and to me, all you're doing is robbing motion. You're you, you might help with pain because anything could help with pain, but actually, you're just you have a tight back and now you have a tight front, and you just have co contractions everywhere. And guess what? You can't really move your spine anymore. You can't get all this stuff um, sloshing around, and that doesn't even go into the side of things which might be like digestion and making sure that everything is moving quite well around there. So, I think for me, that can get super complex. I'm not the person, but I think we should have a mobile spine. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that I think is interesting about that model is also what it implicates about different movement strategies for different uh, physical bodies, right? So someone who has a very wide shoulders and narrow hip is going to adopt a different set of biomechanical positions to optimize that fluid uh, motion versus someone who has, you know, wide hips and narrow shoulders, if you have a belly, um, one of the, you know, we often think that, you know, carrying like mass on your stomach is unathletic, you know, unhealthy, and maybe it's, it's probably not optimally healthy, but it actually has interesting athletic functions. You see a lot of guys in MMA in the heavier divisions, if they have a little bit of a belly, that's a source of kinetic energy. Mm-hmm. And you yeah, see, the you same see some thing. of the base baseball, you see some yeah. of those guys. Yeah. So they're throwing that mass and it's, it's moving in a, in a direction. It's helping them generate a little bit of power. Yeah. And golfers as well. Are you familiar with Sparta performance science? No, uh, I don't think so. Yeah. The group out of the, the Bay area originally, they, they tried to apply, like create a very, very scientific model for movement. Uh, and I think, you know, there's some problems with trying to be too evidence-based you can miss things that are not easily captured under evidence or you create you reify models but i think they found some pretty interesting stuff what they would do is they would do six vertical jumps on a vertical jump platform with every athlete that came in and then create an overall force signature um, model and so what they were looking at is basically they, they ended up finding kind of three primary variables that you see in an athlete in a counter movement so the first one, I think they call it your load ability, which is basically how fast you can spike your uh, ground reaction forces as you're going down into the counter movement, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then the second one they call your uh, explode ability, which is basically how well you stabilize during amortization. So when you're switching from, from the, the eccentric to the concentric, most people are going to lose some of their force production or maybe a substantial amount of their force production. The force production is going to decrease. Um, and then the last ability they called the, I can't remember, sorry. But basically it's your time of force production. So we can look at like how, how quickly you can generate force during the eccentric, how well you stabilize force through the amortization, and then how long you can actually prolong your force production. So that means how deep mm -hmm. you can get into a position and how how long into extension you can go before you move off the ground. Mm -hmm. So someone who That's has really a, interesting. 
Yeah, it's it's. A, I think it's a great model. So one of the things and that that was with a counter movement jump. Yeah, it's counter movement. Yeah. Jump. So okay. if yeah. it's not a counter movement jump, the first two abilities kind of meld into each other. Yeah. You don't see that concentric eccentric um, yeah. switch or eccentric concentric switch. Now, I always liked this model a lot, and I got a lot out of it because I went and trained with them, and they they were like, one of the things they found is that so you put everyone on a percentile on these abilities based on their sort of population. And you find that if, uh, if any one of the abilities is more than 15 percentile points higher than the other ability, then you start to see injury rates increase. Mm. And there's injury rates that are associated with being particularly strong or particularly weak in any ability. So I was 17 points higher, I think on my, my stability during memorization versus my length of, of uh of force production and my tr primary training modality at the time my tr primary uh lift that i was using to try and drive my performance was the deadlift which they found was most associated with building that stability during amortization hmm. and their primary tool for building somebody's time of force production at the time was the bulgarian split squat so they switched me from the deadlift to the split squat and told me never deadlift again it's not <laughs> It's not good for you, your body structure, your neurology is going to always be good at deadlifting without training it. So don't bother. Um, and did it change? Did you get a chance to retest? Uh, after... I, I, uh, I think mm, I can't remember if I got a chance to retest, but it did profoundly change my athleticism and how much time I spent in the gym and my injury rates. Um, you know, at least that was my perception and equals one, right? Yeah, that's really cool. It's really cool. I do a little bit of more so single leg counter movement jump yeah work with people particularly a acl people um mm -hmm. after an aclr i think it's important especially and i especially like to look at how they actually do it do they actually go through knee flexion and knee extension mm -hmm. and how well they can decelerate and accelerate again from that position um i don't have force plates or anything to measure it i will send athletes sometimes to get uh, some testing done we have a really good lab here in in dublin that's pretty close by but i think all of that stuff is really cool but i want to see how people deal with a collision with the floor mm -hmm. and i think the counter movement jump misses that because you will see a lot of snc coaches are amazing at counter movement jumps they look amazing at counter movement <laughs> jumps but they cannot deal with a collision they cannot leave the floor and come back yeah, to the yeah. floor so yeah i think As the darian bar calls collision management right like and yeah, <laughs> i love that meme of the maasai guys jumping and mm -hmm. then the the, <laughs> the the videographer comes over and someone you know it's like your, your strength conditioning coach <laughs> it's a great one yeah um before we move on from that i just wanted to finish the point which I, which i thought was interesting was the Sparta guys, they initially thought there would be one ideal signature athletically. Like you wanted this relationship between all those three variables. What they found was that uh, there were prototypical um, sort of uh, profiles that went with different athletic tasks. So cornerbacks and linebackers in the NFL would have high load and explode and poor time of force production. Whereas pitchers, and golfers had quite seemingly poor ability to stabilize during amortization and very long time of force production. So that was the profile of a rotational athlete. Because basically what they have to do is have that ability to disassociate the, uh, the chest from the, uh, the, the shoulders from the hips mm -hmm. and allow that fluid recoil to really take its time. Whereas, um, you know, basically cornerbacks don't have time, so they're stiff. Yeah, more, le less relative motion. Yeah. Less me relative motion, higher force production. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Or not necessarily higher, but in, yeah, in a shorter time, they have to stiffen up and they get a, they, yeah. they, they have to use their tendons more then as well if they were going to, because you wouldn't, you would, if you're looking at a guy, if you were measuring a, a drop jump and you're looking at RSI and stuff, a golfer wouldn't be very good. <laughs> <laughs> but they um, do what they do yeah exactly they do what they do exactly yeah 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 so that's really cool i'll have to check those guys out yeah it's quite interesting so um there's something that you said that i wanted to dig into which is uh 
Well, one of the things that I guess there's a couple areas that I'm uh, I'm super interested in because of you know the parkour background, right? Within parkour, we have a lot of ankle sprains, a lot of Achilles tendon issues, um, a lot of anterior ankle impingements, and a lot of knee pain. So if we go rewind 15 years ago, we're just kind of as a community discovering the strength conditioning uh, world as a potential ancillary to what we're doing. I got into Mark Ripito, Texas Method. Uh, you know, I learned most of my anatomy from Kelly Starrett, um, which is great. He he helped me a lot. And there's also some things where I think he we missed the boat uh, in, in buying into his model too much. But one of the things was I have more, I think I have more of a, I think it's an antiverted hip and slightly more internally rotated femurs naturally. So I was always trying to fight this, trying to get myself into a more externally rotated position. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was, you know, what was going to, allow me to overcome my knee pain. Now I've been exposed to Joel Smith and you and Adarian Barr talking about inside edge dynamics. And, and, and I'm, and I actually saw a paper recently that said like, there's really not even an association between valgus, like the, those old studies that show the valgus knee uh, was highly associated with ACL tears doesn't really stand up. It's not replicating, but I'm curious if you could talk about the importance of internal rotation at the hip, the importance of pronation, how those play into athletic performance. And then what's the distinction between being able to access good internal rotation versus something like a valgus knee fault? And how do we work with athletes on, on finding the difference? Uh, okay, great question. Um, so to me, a valgus position would be femoral internal where the where the bones aren't actually moving in the same direction so mm -hmm. you're starting to get femoral internal rotation coupled with a tibia that is externally rotating or just not internally rotating or the femur is internally rotating way faster than the tibia so to me that would be a, a valgus type of position and usually that would be coupled with um not necessarily pronation, but more like this e a huge E version of the foot. Mm -hmm. So everything just rolls. So you, yes. So I wouldn't even call it necessarily that you get, no, I won't say that. You, yeah. You just lose the outside of the edge of the foot completely. So let's stop there for a second. Cause I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. The difference between a pronating foot and an everting foot, why that's it. Mm -hmm you know, what, what you are looking for there and why that's such an important distinction. So they're both strategies, I will say, to push through the floor. So we can push from a pronated shape or a more everted shape. To me, uh, I would define pronation as the opening of the joints on the plantar surface of the foot. So the bottom of the foot, the joints actually open and if the joints, if you can't open your joints, you're still at the bottom of the foot, you're still going to find a way to pressurize the foot. Cause when we pronate, like our body weight is coming on top of the foot and our foot is pushing down into the floor, floor, it's compressing, like I said earlier. So that's how we push through the floor. And if you can't actually open the joints, you still have to find a way to push. And a lot of people, the strategy they will find is everting. So rolling towards the inside. It's actually a decent strategy. You see a lot of sprinters do this at high speed where they don't have time to open the joints, but they still need to put a, put pressure. They want to stay quite stiff, but they still need to get to the inside of the foot. That's where we would need to push from and they will just evert. But that's quite a safe movement, I would say, because they're running pretty straight. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes a little bit trickier, I think, when you're trying to put high force into the ground and change it and change direction and you evert a lot and you get this maybe knee valgus where the femur turns in, the tibia doesn't. Yeah, that could be a tricky position. But again, you see it in sport again and again and again. So it's not necessarily the most optimal position to push from. But guess what? In sport, you're going to be there. You just so you have to be there. That's what that's what I think. So, so eversion and pronation are yeah, they're not they're not quite the same thing. One is just rolling in. One is actually opening the joints on the on, on the bottom of the foot. So for folks who are not watching this, who are just listening to it, if you imagine that the foot is like a dome, then pronation is the dome widening and spreading out. Mm -hmm. And this should happen in every step of your gait cycle as your foot hits the ground, those joints are going to open to kind of absorb the force. Yeah. 
whereas the E version is actually tipping the whole ankle to the side, to the inside edge of the foot. Yeah, correct. Exactly. And the it's, it's, it is important to try and understand the difference because I think when people talk about arches of the foot or the arch, actually a lot of people say, oh, I, I'm, my arch is doing this. Well, actually you have three arches in the foot mm -hmm. and this so so if you want to pronate your foot you would need to get length from foot front to back so the foot gets a little bit longer you get a little bit of pressure into the inside so the medial arch opens the transverse arch opens and and you you get length so it, get, it gets wider and longer in every direction mm -hmm. so it's really that would be true pronation and, and that really can only be achieved by keeping the outside of the foot on the floor but you can still the outside of the foot stays down but you get pressure towards the inside the eversion then is where actually none of the arches change shape. The foot stays the exact same shape and it literally just rolls towards the inside. So two different strategies, I would say neither good or neither bad necessarily. They're just good strategies for different, for different times, but they're not the same thing. That's what I think is, is important. It would be like, it would be like you bending down to pick up a pen and actually opening or moving all of the joints through your spine. You every single joint flexes through your spine versus uh, doing like a hip hinge to pick up the pen off the floor. So you haven't moved your spine at all, even though your whole, your foot or your spine has moved in space. You haven't gotten any relative motion at the joints themselves. I think Greg Lemon would say that we are not capable of of hip hinging without spinal flexion, anyways, and that's a myth. But yeah, uh, but but, I, I, but we can we, we, we will flex we will more motion. And yeah, we will we will flex somewhere in the spine but we will miss a lot of flexion yeah yeah so um i think it's 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 interesting because like i i remember talking to joel about this about how there's like a we think that something like prone over pronation is the problem um or over reversion is the problem but it's something more like poor rhythm and timing of pronation is actually the problem because i'm thinking about all these kids who you come into like a beginner parkour class and they just have floppy pancake feet right <laughs> yeah. like everything just collapses it's weak it has no tension to it and and they tend to duck foot out and to have internal like you to have pretty valgus knees and you can see that it's not efficient it's not powerful and often those are the kids who get you know osgood slatters they get uh, tendonitis but on the other hand like go watch some Kyrie Irving uh highlights and you'll see him completely evert and end up like on the side of his ankle like a car on two wheels in the middle of a crossover and you'll see that it's graceful it's powerful he recovers quickly out of that position and gets to other positions that allow him to perform athletically so how do you think about the, the difference between how Kyrie's using a position like eversion because I, I I don't know. Tell me if I'm wrong. When I'm thinking about Kyrie doing crossovers and footwork, I think he's not just pronating; he's everting a lot. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um. But so when you see it there versus when you see Pancake Foot Kid and how you get how you prepare <laughs> Pancake Foot Kid to not hurt his knees I think without telling him that he has to be, you know, like a without giving him the guada sort of model of like yeah never you know. do this yeah never. yeah because then you just rob an option that they're going to need so yeah. i think it comes back to i think a lot of it comes back to options so if you look at some of the best basketball basketballers in the world a lot of them start with a very pronated foot their foot is there already uh, same with a lot of the best sprinters in the world. They start with a, quite a flat foot and it's actually because of a time constraint. So they, we, we know that true stance phase. So I'm going to strike. I'm going to, I'm going to swing through the air just before I strike. I'm going to be in a slightly more supinated position. I'm going to strike the ground. My foot is going to have to pronate and then re-supinate again. But if you think about time constraints, I have such a small amount of time on the ground. Then what's a great way of actually almost pushing before they hit the ground it's starting in a more pronated shape but yeah. if you look at these great athletes it's it's not a floppy pancake foot it's actually the exact opposite they start in a, a, a pronated foot shape more often than not particularly where there's time constraints on the sport and 
there's a ton of tension on the bottom of the foot and the top of the foot. You'll actually see like curled toes a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Toes are scrunched together. The foot is super tense. And yep. actually, their hips are quite tense as well. They don't tend to have tons of range of motion if you put them on a table or look at a deep squat. They don't tend to have tons and tons of range of motion. So, But if you ask them to move in all different ways, you, you're asking them to start to complete tasks, you'll start to see that they do have options. They can do all these different tasks in a nice way. When you look at floppy pancake foot kid, they this is the only way they can move. They have no choice. They can't actually show you any other options. And... I would say, okay, the strategy that they're using is not a bad strategy. It's fine. It's actually the strategy that they're most comfortable and they're strong at. And I wouldn't try and take that away, but I would try and give them access to all of these other strategies. Whereas historically, traditionally, some systems will literally just strap a band around the knees or something and say, your knees will never, ever come in. And now we're setting people up for failure because we're not even giving them another good strategy. We're literally just taking away the only one they have. So I think a lot of it comes back to options and really feet are going to respond well when you start to leave the floor and come back to the floor again, because you can't be floppy if you want to jump, if you want to not just jump high, but if you want to, if you want to spend not that much time on the ground, then you're that occurs and these athletes are able to do amazing things because their system is so well fine-tuned and they're able to find the perfect amount of pre-tensioning before their foot hits the floor so their their nervous system their reflexive system it, it just knows how much tension to put in the lower leg actually in the whole body let's say before the foot hits the floor and so really floppy, floppy pancake foot kid needs to sp probably spend a lot of time playing, jumping, finding all these different positions, crawling where their toes are going to be more extended. And, and to me, that's, I, th I think that's an obvious answer. Not a, you know, like not a, cause it's a, it's a question I get all the time and I, I don't, people are like, Oh, should I, because this athlete does, does one thing, and my kid does it, but they don't look the same. I'm like, just give them as many options as you can, train them in a, in in a variety of ways, and leave them figure it out. Yeah, that's it's interesting. That's that's very much where I've gone because I'm very influenced by like the ecological constraints literature and play research literature. So, um, I when I see people who who have a very mechanical model, even if it seems very sophisticated, um. I always wonder like how much you are actually wanting to impose that on an athlete versus just put them in situations where they get to solve lots of uh, problems and scale those situations such that they're not too demanding on the body and don't, don't, don't have that huge increase in load. I was, um, yeah. So that's that. Uh, so when we get to talking about these mechanics of inside edge, outside edge, you know, getting the shin forward i i always i think there's a lot of value to that conversation and i also am always worried about like are you just producing another model that's constraining the athlete in a way that they don't need to be constrained and they'll solve the problem if you just give them the right kind of movement nutrition mm -hmm. that's a tricky question uh yeah. that's why i that's why i try and surround myself or look, look at people like you and just just try and keep an open mind all the time because i love biomechanics I, I i love looking at movement and analyzing it and trying to figure out what's going on and it's quite nice in rehab as well to see what position someone's avoiding and actually be able to pinpoint some things and, and introduce load in that direction but the complexity of our study needs to lead to simplicity in our coaching and our, and the outcomes that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And that's what I try and teach to like the people that come to our workshops. We're learning this, some of this language so that we can speak to each other. And I don't think, I don't think more knowledge is ever an issue. Mm -hmm. I think we can get really good at analyzing movement, trying to see exactly what's going on, different phases of gait, understanding what positions people need access to, what positions they're avoiding, and still understand the dynamic systems theory and constraints and how we actually learn and use our biomechanical knowledge and to, to deliver very simple 
methods of changing how they move without trying to force people into a box. And that's what I'm always trying to get better at doing. And yeah, that's my overall thing for the last 12 months. I've been speaking a lot about that, how our complexity needs to lead us to a simplicity, not to more complexity. Yeah, I think that's a really, that's a beautiful, um, a beautiful, quick statement, right? That's the slogan for, for good teaching there. Um, so I want to, I'm, I'm curious about digging into specifically uh, dorsiflexion, right? Because, so there's a couple of reasons. One, so I've theoretically struggled with dorsiflexion. I had eight ankle sprains. I, have, I had seven or eight ankle sprains between 12 and 18 years of old, old. And then I've had a couple bad ankles, three bad ankle sprains as an adult. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's taken away a lot of my range of motion. So I've worked really hard to get that range of motion back. But even now, like I, on a wall test, I can do five, six inches on one side and five inches on the other side. I still struggle to like have a really comfortable deep squat. I think part of that is proportional. I have pretty long femurs versus my shin bones. I'm like, ah, how much more I can, can ask of this. But the other aspect of that is that stiffer ankles are associated with greater speed, right? So mm -hmm. I'm like, what the reason that I'm really hungry for more dorsiflexion is that I feel like my spine is getting hyperflexed when I'm taking landings because I'm not getting that flexion out of my lower body. And I worry about the, the excessive load on my spine. Now, my son, so I have relatively flat feet. My son and my wife have very high arched feet. So my two daughters have more flat feet and they have really good access to a deep squat position. My son, um, is, you know, you just saw his video, right? You can see the extraordinary athletic achievements he's making. Uh, he's really fast, but he doesn't have access to a, much of a good deep squat. Like he really has to go very flexed in his spine to get access mm -hmm. to a deep squat. And he's pretty uncomfortable and not very stable down there. Mm -hmm. And so part of me is like, okay, we need to start doing, you know, Ido Portal, 30 minutes of squatting a day with him. And the part of me is like, am I going to be taking away this thing that he has, which is that he's so elastic and so springy. Like if you look at a, a, a slow motion video, like he can jump something that's as high as his like, above his sternum, just hurdle over it. And if you watch a video of him doing that, you'll see that his his knee is barely flexing, right? Yeah. He has so much expansive ability. So how do you think about the, the role of getting the appropriate dorsiflexion versus the need of an explosive athlete to be able to express that stiffness in the ankle joint? uh okay so i've worked i've had the pleasure of working with a couple of world-class sprinters mm -hmm. and they have trash dorsiflexion <laughs> trash and i would not like to change that too much um i would say okay so i would say i would say a couple of things here i wouldn't go and do the edo portal squatting with him yeah because guess what's going to happen he's going to start to get more and more flexion through his spine to sit into that squat and which is, which isn't necessarily a bad thing at all uh but the thing that you're trying to open up is ankle dorsiflexion and ankle dorsiflexion comes along with pronation mm -hmm. so you're going to get foot pronation and ankle dorsiflexion you're going to get ankle you're going to get plantar flexion and supination yeah. so what you really want to start to do is give him access to move moving at more joints, not just to an end position. I would say, you no. Know, what you might want to do, sorry, you not you definitely not definitely want to do this, but you want to start to give a chance uh, his midfoot a chance to open up yeah. and to, to drop that chin forward and get some tibial internal rotation. If if you want more dorsiflexion, so you share it out. Because if you look at the people who do the Edo Portal thing or a lot of a lot of athletes that end up deeper and deeper into a squat position, they get there, their knee will get further and further forward. But if you actually zoom in and see what's happening, I have a perfect video of a client that does this. He, they are stretching their Achilles more and more and more rather than actually getting joints to move more and more and more uh, and, and, and their lower back. So I would, the quality that, that, every single person in the world wants more of is speed and elasticity 
Mm-hmm. So if he has that, amazing. Don't rob, don't try and rob that from him. Yeah, you um, want to avoid that. Yeah, you want to avoid robbing that. So let's keep that. And if we want to open up some dorsiflexion, flexion, we're going to do it in a smart way where we start to get the midfoot to move and to to open up some joints there. Rather than thinking about a knee to wall, how far can I get my knee forward? It's more like how more can I get a tiny bit more movement through this foot, which allows the tibia to drop and turn in a little bit more. So. Yeah. That's what I would say with, with regards to your feet. It's not surprising to hear that your feet are a little bit flatter when your t- when your femur is pushed into a, is beginning more in, in in internal rotation. So, for you to access some more dorsiflexion, I would just use like a simple kind of pronation drill that you just stand in a very small split stance position. I've actually done this with a couple of parkour guys, um, a good few years ago. And you, you just make sure that as you come out into a straight knee with that front leg, that you're getting, you're starting with a little bit of tibial external rotation. You're, you'll start to feel a little bit of supination. And then as you let your knee come forward, you're getting a little bit of tibial internal rotation. And I would focus on milking tibial IR and ER out while keeping your heel contact down. And you start to feel your midfoot kind of accessing a little bit of pronation and supination and i would be surprised i wouldn't be surprised at all if within a couple of days on that side that had got very very stiff and has had a lot of injuries that that started to open up a lot uh, rather than the idea or both sides maybe yeah rather than you know trying to think about end range like how far forward can i get i would start to think about can i milk out this rotation through my through mm-hmm. my lower leg and, and my midfoot and that will give you space. Space is the thing that a lot of people are lacking. They end up compensating for space by like kind of stretching more through their Achilles or their calf rather than getting more joints to open. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, I like that idea of getting more joints to open. Uh, my son, high arched foot. Uh, I was watching, if you watched like the second and most recent video of him on my channel where he's running up a tree, you'll see there's a step where his 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 external rotate his external rotation as he's running up this tree is just so far out like mm-hmm. it's like boom he has so much access to that but yeah his feet are stiff you know and it's like so what's striking me in the moment is like if we want to have a like just a very easy clear movement task that requires a lot of movement of the bones in the feet just be tree climbing in bare feet right uh at the if they want well i don't know i don't climb too many trees but you're going to see the thing with the the tree climbing is i presume that you're going to be in a lot of big toe extension or extension through all the toes Mm -hmm. because you're going to kind of almost like you're pulling yourself up or you're walking up the tree in that way an extension of the toes is going to couple with a supination at the foot Mm -hmm. so you're going to drive a lot of supination in that way one of the other things you do is you'll actually turn your foot side out. And yeah. And, and you'll roll in roll and you'll down. grab, which yeah. is, so you're, you're, you're training a locking up foot, but you have to put pressure to the inside. So we're going back to that E version. Mm-hmm. So he's going to train, he's going to learn to keep his foot, not learn, but he's going to do it in that way where the, the big toe extension drives a bit more supination. And then he presses weight into the inside edge of his foot, which is that E version. Yeah. So I would, because really the only way of unlocking our midfoot, which if you want a bit more of that for him, which you don't necessarily need, he has a strategy and he moves really, really well. Um, mm-hmm. But if you wanted more of that, the only way of unlocking a midfoot is actually compressive forces in, in, in standing or in standing up. Okay. So, so like you could do some plyometrics and pogos and stuff like that with him, where you're focusing on a small bit more of a full foot contact. Mm-hmm uh not necessarily just up on the toes and they're slightly slower yeah. so each contact he's going to get his knees just kind of dropping his tibias are dropping forward a little bit and he's going to start to get a tiny bit of internal rotation there and if you start to do those on the double leg going forwards backwards side to side you will start to and twisting and all single leg you'll start to open up a decent bit of movement if the intention is on spending that little bit more time on the ground yeah uh- I want to talk about the yielding versus overcoming uh, plyometric idea and kind of how you think about progressing plyometrics uh, Mm -hmm. in a second. But before we finish, I think it's interesting in the role of dorsiflexion. If you look at elite parkour athletes, there's a lot of them who've had injuries and have lost dorsiflexion capacity, but the best ones tend to have a lot of dorsiflexion and ability to get into deep 
ranges of motion with relatively neutral spines. So it seems to be particularly useful for landing precision jumps. So when you land that precision jump, if you're, if you're going into a flex position, it's harder to control. And if you can get the shin moving forward to give you more, then it seems like that's useful. The other thing about parkour versus like track sprinting is there's not a, there's very little, um, there's very little maximal speed work. It's very acceleration oriented, right? You're hitting the ground and you're needing to get shin forward in order to get acceleration. And so you'll see the, a lot of these really elite parkour athletes. If you want to look at someone who's interesting in this way, it'd be like someone like Seth Wang. Um, they're really good at getting kind of the shin past the foot. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm curious about that, the demand of, of, of like parkour, which is obviously locomotive running and jumping versus like sprinting where it's really about just that, you know, optimizing for getting a lot of force into the ground as quickly as possible. Once you reach those Excel, uh, those higher velocities. Yes. And this, this goes nicely into the kind of yielding and overcoming ideas around plyometrics, because what you're describing there is the need for in parkour, the ability to yield more and kind of drop into positions a lot more. And then the perfect exact opposite of that would be a hundred meter sprinter who all they do is overcome. They're, they're looking to yield the least amount possible. So uh, so yeah, with yielding, you're going to see more flexion associated with it and a little bit more external rotation associated with it. Um, and with overcoming, you're going to see a little bit more internal rotation and extension. So sprinters are going to, are going to set up in a more extent, like they're going to be a very extended spine almost all of the time, quite extended, more of an anterior pelvic tilt, mm-hmm. uh, more, they're going to strike the ground and they're going to set up usually in a little bit more pronation to begin with their foot is a bit flatter so they have a bit more internal rotation there um because all they need to do is go one direction they need to go forward as fast as they can so they're actually more expanded if you want to go back to expansion and compression they're more expanded at the front of their body and they're more super compressed around the back of their body Mm -hmm. and that's because they just need to go forward whereas a parkour person needs to have variability and options in all different directions they need to be able to yield and drop they need to be able to let their shins drop forward um so but but they also to, they need to be able to overcome as well. There's a lot of variety in their movement. They need to be able to push and and kind of actually some of my ideas around yielding and overcoming plyometrics first came from a, a parkour video that I saw. Basically, a guy like jumping off a bridge and landing, and he didn't like I don't know what you call it in parkour where like a lot of your landings are. I kind of take the force, I kind of push it or I like I roll out of it or I step yeah. forward or whatever. But this guy like almost landed just, I'll find a video for you. He landed in a squat position, like he just dropped and he didn't stiffen up in any way, shape or form. He literally just dropped every single thing in his body flexed. He, he, he hit the bottom position and he just got this return where it was like a cat. He bounced about three feet back up into the air. Yeah, I think and- I know exactly the clip you're talking about. It's David Bell. So before that, he does the big manpower gap, right? So he does the huge drop onto the between the two buildings, mm-hmm. does a does a vault down, and then comes to a bridge. He turn vaults on the bridge, yeah, yeah, yeah drops yeah. straight down off of that, and yeah. yeah, it's really an extraordinary. Um, it's 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 hard because it's it's pretty low quality, right? It's like uh, you know, not not uh, it's harder to see exactly what's happening. It's not in slow motion and it's low resolution, but um but he bounces in this extraordinarily insanely elastic way from a huge drop but if you look at it his foot is pronated everted his shins are in his back is flexed mm-hmm. but it showcases this uh you know so it's not it's not what we thought was perfect technique 10 years ago at least um, yeah, he just shared that load out across everything because that that is I think that is the first time where I really thought deeply about our ability to to yield in our jumps in our plyometrics because mm-hmm. traditionally in the industry it's taught like okay faster off the floor faster off the floor and it kind of makes sense because of a lot of our plyo stuff has come from the track and field world which is all 
super, you know, st- stopwatch sports. But if you think about rugby, you think about soccer, you think about just movement in general, you need to be able to change levels. You need to be able to drop up and down and not just drop up and down. You need to be able to drop up and down fast. And when I saw that ability of that parkour guy to, to, to do that, I was like, oh, I'm missing a big trick here by only training, leaving the ground and stiffening back up when I come back to the ground and not be able to drop into positions and be strong in deep positions. And yeah, you can stiffen up in a deep position or you can yield in a deep position. But if he stiffened up in that position, like if he tried to fight and, and overcome the ground, he would have blown out every joint in his body. He would have blown out discs in his back, but he just went with that, extended that collision for as long as he could and just got this return. And that is an amazing video. Yeah. I got to show you a video of my friend Dylan Baker accidentally taking a 20 foot drop. Um, I think you'll find the, his hand slips out on a massive like ascent and he just takes it. His back was sore for a few days, but otherwise he was fine. Yeah. Um, that's insane. So, that's yeah. that's some yielding plyometric capacity there. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, the, the the one that I wanted to mention as far as like really good yielding strength and power is wrestlers, right? That capacity to to drop down all the way to the deepest shin, exp- uh, deepest squat position or lunge position, and explode out of it rapidly. It's a really cool and unique ability. It's one reason why, like um. I, 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 I've wanted my son to do that because I'm like, that's, that's probably the most athletic expression of this side of things that he's not as naturally good at. Right. Um, but it's interesting because he, he knows he's not good at that. Um, so he doesn't try to shoot on people. He tries to invite them to shoot on him because he knows yeah. that he's stronger and more agile. And that once they're grabbing, if he can get his down blocks, he'll just, he'll just out upper body wrestle them. He's on the defense. Yeah, I, I, I'm doing the same thing in jujitsu when we start from a yeah. stand up position, but yeah. it's not because I feel like I'm stronger or anything. I'm just being. I don't. I do not want someone to body slam me. Not <laughs> yet. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, wrestlers are some of the most explosive athletes. Mm-hmm. When you see videos of what they can do and how they can drop, they can change levels and then they can generate so much force from there. They can overcome muscle slack all their muscles get tense up from from a very deep position and they just explode and that is definitely something as well that i would want my hopefully i'll have kids someday and i would love them to be able to do that type of thing and to just yeah. be able to manipulate someone else's body in that way is a very powerful thing so yeah i want to come back to that i i listened to your your podcast on the best sports for kids to make a mover now I have a whole... I, 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 you're the one person that I would have liked to, um, <laughs> I, I, I will, I will get you on, on the podcast someday and we can chat about that. Okay. Let's do that one. Um, but, uh, but before we do, I want to talk about like, um, I, I guess the, where I want to kind of go with you to, to end this is looking specifically at that ear anterior ankle impingement yeah. and problems of the Achilles tendon, and then how someone who's already doing parkour can incorporate a good sort of plyometric progression to help prepare those tissues so that we're not going to face these issues. So um, maybe let's just start with the anterior ankle. Have you, have you seen this injury? We call it an ankle thing in parkour. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. It's just a blocking at the front of the ankle. Just yeah. that pinching. Yeah. Yeah. What happens all the time is like you, you just jump to an edge and you're not well organized when you hit that edge and your ankle has to take all of it. Mm-hmm. And you just jam the ankle, the, the anterior aspect of the ankle together. So a lot of parkour athletes have done this many times now. We have like, it's easy to trigger that injury and you get this, yeah, this terrible pain <laughs> in the front of your ankle. And then yeah. not all the time. So some, some athletes end up kind of hypermobile and then falling that easily. But the other thing that happens is that you just lose your dorsiflexion completely. Your body's just like, no, we, we don't need to do that because yeah. it's not safe makes sense for a brain to say nope you ain't you're never going there again yeah. um so yeah a lot uh, i i have uh, had a parkour client a good few years ago uh like i've seen i see these ankle impingements all the time but i did have one guy in particular uh who and it's it's just a very sore thing it's a, it's it's not nice it just feels like bones are jamming into each other mm-hmm. and 
to me, that just comes back to you're trying to get your dorsiflexion and you're not opening space. You're not getting any pronation to occur as you do it. it and that doesn't mean you could be someone who has a very flat foot. Yeah. Or you could be someone who, but a flat foot doesn't mean a flat foot could be a very stiff foot still. It's a stiff flat foot or a stiff supinated foot. There, there are two options. So an easy way of like a, pra- a couple of practical ways of, of playing around with that. One is mobilizing, forget about the ankle for a while, mobilizing the foot. So actually getting into, I don't do much manual therapy, but you can actually just sit down and get your hands on your foot and start to try and move the metatarsals around, start to twist the calcaneus around, particularly get the calcaneus like block the rest of the foot and at the, the heel bone and, and try and get it to evert and internally rotate a little bit, get space in between the metatarsals, just open up some movement in the foot. And then the second one, you could get into a half kneeling position and I can post these videos somewhere if people want to yeah. watch them as well, but okay. um, into a half kneeling position. So let's say it's my right ankle. So I'm kneeling on my left knee. My right foot is in front. You can just kind of cup your tibia and, and just rocking your knee forward and back, making sure your heel stays down and just kind of gently guiding your tibia into internal rotation as you come forward and then external rotation as you come back. And then you can do a similar thing in standing just where you kind of let your knee move towards your big toe as you as you rock your weight in and out. And I would be shocked if that didn't open up some space for people and start to get just lots of bones, lots of space, lots of joints opening. I know I've said kind of the same thing, but that's really where dorsiflexion comes from. And that's, yeah. that's, it's a, such an easy solution as far, not, not easy to solve in, in general, but easy to start to feel better is, is doing something like that. If you haven't been doing something like that already. So kind of a, uh, a preparatory, like, how to avoid this interior ankle thing would be make sure you're addressing motion in the foot. And uh, I was listening to your thing on, um, on the Achilles and you're talking about like, let's make sure that we have uh, sensitivity, right? So can you actually sense changes in your foot position? Yeah. Pressure shifting. That's yeah. not, it, it sounds silly, but like people can't do it. They don't have awareness. They're not no. strong in different parts of their feet. Yeah, I definitely well aware of how somatically blind most of us are to a lot of our body. Mm-hmm. So, so, so sensitize that foot, get good motion in the foot. And then basically we just need to, I would think kind of progressively load in a pretty intense, um, you know, leave dorsiflex position <laughs> and just be able to, we need to some exposure to that before it happens by accident in the sport. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. A different, a different mix of contacts are, would be would be quite nice. So that's where some of the yielding plyos can come in quite nicely. Where mm-hmm. you get into a you're getting into a lunge position, maybe like a shorter lunge position, and you're you're jumping in that position. You're landing, but you're not trying to stiffen up. You're actually trying to sink all the way down into the movement before your back knee touches the ground and come back up again. You can jump pretty high, but just on the landing, you're not trying to stiffen up. You're trying to actually let your knee and your tibia drop forward. Um, you can obviously add a weight or a ball. You can do that in 3D in different directions. Um, you can do that like more on a, a single leg or in a slight split stance position. So those are nice ways to do it. You can do little jumps and stuff where... If you get down into a bottom of a squat with your heels off the ground, um, so like most everyone will be able to get into that position where your heels are actually off the ground and you can do little jumps where you're going up and down, like all the way up into a tall position, all the way back down into a squatted position with your heels off the floor. So now you're letting your knees drop forward without your heels being on the floor, which is a lot of the time where that type of issue will occur where your knees jam forward and like there's just nowhere left for them to go because they're at end range and then so those would be like yielding type of contacts in in a deep position and then the other ones would be uh more a little bit more like upright more traditional plyometrics but done not super stiff not trying to be super fast off the ground but like just nice pogos where you spend a tiny bit longer on the ground let your knees flex and just do it in all different directions and you can just open up so much space build so much strength and that goes for ankles that goes for achilles calf issues shin splints toe issues there's loads of options there and it's also fun and it also will make you more athletic yeah it's interesting i i suddenly have this idea of just like wrestler plyometrics 
All right, like <laughs> learn from the wrestlers and how they develop their shooting mechanics. And then that's going to give you really good, deep, yielded position explosiveness and uh, horizontal explosiveness, right, from deep positions. Yeah. Um, just, just don't let them slam you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, uh, so the Achilles thing is interesting. A lot of, like, the Achilles tendon tears are a pretty common injury in the in the parkour community. I tore my Achilles tendon in 2010. Um, uh, my training partner, who I started with 18 years ago, tore his Achilles tendon a couple years later. Um, the owner of the parkour gym up in uh, in Vancouver tore his Achilles tendon, and it's a weird injury because it's it's wall running it's running up walls that does it um almost it's running up walls or jumping into walls i had one friend who did it by bottoming bottoming out in a uh um in a foam pit and you know he just didn't expect it so his his body wasn't prepared but mostly it's just running up walls and what's what's hard about it is that you don't tend to perceive that anything's wrong and then all of a sudden you have this major injury that can take a very long time to recover yeah. from. Yeah. So is there anything we can do to kind of like bulletproof ourselves against this as we're pursuing the ability to run 13 feet up a wall or jump 14 feet to a flat wall, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 feet to a flat wall? <laughs> um, so I suppose if you think like the best, the best way of, trying to combat this is doing the sport right and and we all know that and i know it's a easy answer but it is the correct answer because a lot of people a lot of parkour guys and girls are probably doing this and very few are getting injured so re relatively fewer are getting injured so but imagine that you asked me to do that i would definitely tear my achilles <laughs> uh, so you can because I don't want, always want the solutions to be like get in the gym and X, Y, and Z when ultimately like exposure to the positions that you're going to be in is the ultimate. Yeah, it, it really is. And it's just about like, I, I would guess that. So I, I've torn my Achilles and my brother has torn his Achilles and both, both playing football. And it actually happened. Both, we trained together for like 12 years. And the one year that we never, we didn't train together, we played on the same team, same schedule, and we never had an Achilles injury. The one year that we both had an Achilles injury, we both, within six weeks of each other, like I, I had to ring him and get his crutches. Uh, <laughs> we, we hadn't trained. We weren't playing with the same team. We weren't doing any of the same gym work, anything like that. And we hadn't in two or three years prior to that. But his one came six weeks after he had a new child. And he basically hadn't slept in six weeks. Yeah, yeah. So, for like the answer for him was, you've had an amazing career. You're now 35 years old. You're still trying to play Gaelic football at a really high level. And you also haven't slept in six weeks. And you also arrived late for training and didn't warm up. So, like, there's a perfect storm of things. And I would say for a lot of people in the parkour community, they might have ran up that wall a hundred times, a thousand times, and it happened one day. And I don't want to be the person that just says, okay, it's just because you are weak in this, no. you know, or just because you were lacking range, because it could be that it just happened. Same with Kobe Bryant when he did his, like there's people saying, this is like, I, I could have fixed him if, if he didn't oh, move yeah. into this position, but he did that 10 million thousand times before that. So I, I, I don't know is the answer for these big ruptures and stuff. I think it it could be a perfect storm of things. So probably the best answer is make sure you're make sure you're not doing stupid training in terms of like in terms of like yeah, training yes. loads and you're recovering and a little mix of Soleil's strength, like bent knee calf raise work, straight knee calf raise work, plyometrics. It's simple stuff, but it could be the difference. But the issue is you never know if it was the difference. Because if you never tore your Achilles, you might say, well, all that stuff that I did, all that strength training and plyometrics, that was a waste of time. Yeah. But maybe maybe you would have tore something if you didn't do it. Yeah, that's it. That's always the interesting thing with like these uh, prehab sort of ideas is 
you can stack yourself with so much prehab then you're just not doing sport or doing anything interesting and it's very hard to to know counterfactually like what it's doing um we uh my sense is that most achilles injuries and actually i now think about this as like i really think most injuries are due to just poor control of loading variability uh it's just letting yourself spike too high and also not accounting for uh stresses outside of training not being like i have to adjust my training because uh i just got interviewed by jordan peterson and i've got 80 zoom calls scheduled over the next three weeks yeah. like, okay. so for me it was like i'm gonna train once this week and that's okay and then yeah twice the next week and then i'll i'll get back to it um if i had tried to to just totally maintain my training schedule my likelihood of injury in that period of time would have spiked i believe substantially yes and then you would have went to a physio and they would have told you it's because you didn't have a strong glute or something which, <laughs> yeah. but what why yeah. what 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 yeah, why I didn't know. i get injured for the last five years you know yeah. so yeah. we always want to pin something on one one thing that's an obvious answer usually that we can sell but the reality is not as easy as that yeah so good maintenance of just like stress management sleep nutrition and then i went to colorado like spike in loading coming up in two weeks and so i was like i'm going to try as much as possible to actually only train as much as i normally would over that period of time so i i took one training day off in preparation for it so i could stack that into those days and then i tried to train for two hours each day of training and not let it sprawl into four or five, six hours mm -hmm. because, you know, and I think that that's been the magic for me in making a lot of progress over the last year as a, uh, uh, as a 41 year old, um, coming back from injuries and health problems, uh, is I, I train at a gym where they kick me out after 90 minutes. <laughs> yeah. That, that comes with experience uh, as well yeah. of actually knowing that, yeah, maybe I should cut this one now. Because yeah. it's always like, it's always the extra rep. It's always like, yeah, I'll just give, we'll give me one more. Yeah. Then yeah. you regret yeah. that one more. But that's also the being young. Like I kind of miss, I, I, I also like don't want to have that experience. I, I would, I would gladly put me back at 19 where I didn't know anything and just let me fuck myself up again because <laughs> that's the fun part too. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's a good place to finish our conversation for today. I'd love to join you on your podcast and tell you why uh, parkour is the number one um, uh, un uh, what did you call it uh, unmissables uh, aspect of of non negotiables. Yeah, I non negotiables. I, 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 I probably wouldn't argue too hard with parkour. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, that that'd be a fun conversation. We got a lot. I, I wrote a whole article about um, the universal athletic blueprint. I can send to you. Um, yes please and uh yeah thank you very much for for joining me on the podcast and I, I look forward to future conversations for folks who are interested in knowing how to uh to take care of their ankles their upper body um you've got a bunch of good programs online you've got your own podcast you know picture stuff for people uh i'll keep it simple so a good place to go is just instagram is david gray rehab g-r-e-y because people can see my mug there. They might think I sound okay, but then they see me and they're like, oh, I don't like this guy at all. <laughs> so Instagram is a good place to go. And uh, yeah, we have we actually have a new foot and Achilles foot, like ankle Achilles program, yeah. four phases, which kind of builds people up from working on mobility, strength, up to plyometrics again. So I think that would be maybe valuable for people. Apart from that, I won't pitch anything. I appreciate you having me on. And um, I really like your work. Really, really, really mean that. I think it's super valuable something that i'd love to dive into more um as the years goes by go by i'd love to come to a retreat or something like that someday as well and uh yeah thanks for having me on keep doing what you're doing thank you very much